Our speaker tonight is Richard Hyam. Hello. And um, he's going to uh, do what I'm sure is a fascinating presentation on a surgeon at the Battle of the Nile. That's and it. I won't uh, steal his thunder by telling you about the family connection, which I'm sure you'll I wouldn't uh, you'll dare, elaborate. For goodness sake. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Absolutely. Thank you. But she's speaking just first for, to say something. Just for a moment, we have a most important announcement. From important Claire. announcement. Thank you. From yes. Um, hi everyone. Uh, my name. Oh, is that? Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Christy Bellard, and I'm from the Health Sciences Library. Um, I'm filling in for my boss, whom you all know, Richard German, uh, tonight. <laughs> Donald Kerr, he's a special collections librarian, has generously <coughs> offered us his exhibition space at the end of this year, and we are wanting to do an exhibition on the Medical Library's historic collection. Um, and Terry has very kindly um, put up several works that he'd like to be featured, uh, and all that's required is a choosing a historic work and writing about 200 words about it. So I thought I'd come along tonight and just make you aware of it because I'm sure that some of you would have accessed our historic uh, collection up on the third floor. So if you're interested in accessing those books again and perhaps writing 200 words about why you like the work uh, and coming along to the exhibition, uh, we'd really love to hear from you. So I've left my business cards and Richard up the front and of course Terry's going to be a major player player in this <laughs> exhibition. Um, so if you'd like to contact either Richard or myself or Terry about it, we'd love to hear from you because um, we really want to see uh, the use that the collection's gathered over the time that it's been there. So thank you everyone. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. Now, Richard, we've been looking forward to this so much. Well, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. Thank you. Well done. Well, the connection with this fellow George Bellamy and uh, Terry said, would I just say what it is? Uh, this George Bellamy had a son who was also a surgeon and he had a daughter who married a Hyam and he was unfortunately not very good in business and the Bellamy family ganged up on him and they sent him overseas to Australia where he died falling off a ladder dead drunk on a May morning. Um, back in England, Rose Hyam, ex-Bellamy, bought up the kids as Bellamy's and so even now, passwords in the Heim family are Bellamy. We are like Bellamy's. We, are, we think of ourselves as a Bellamy family after this extraordinary ca uh, caper at the Nile. Uh, Rose had a son, he had a son, and I am the result of that, and so is Charlie over there. Charlie, wave about. Here's my brother Charles. And um, uh, I'm going to tell you about the Battle of the Nile through the eyes of this surgeon, George Bellamy. Uh, stop me if you think it's confusing, and if you can't hear, just shout. That is the, uh, that's the victory, actually, not the Bellerophon. There's no picture of the Bellerophon at all because it was broken up in 1832. Here he was, a naval surgeon born in 1772. His grandfather and his father were both in the Navy, and they were senior people, master carpenters. And so they naturally said to him, you ought to go in the Navy, and they thought he might be a surgeon. So they got apprenticed to a fellow called Mowbray, who was the surgeon in the Plymouth Hospital. They all lived in Plymouth, which is, of course, a great port. And, uh, and that's where he was born and brought up. There he is as a young man. That is his apprenticeship record, um, which you can't read, but the terms and conditions are really rather funny. Look at this. George Bellamy, son of Mr. George Bellamy, carpenter of his majesty's ship glory, doth put himself apprentice to Robert Mowbray, MD, of his majesty's royal doctor, dockyard for the five-year term. He should observe his master's secrets keep his lawful commandments and do no damage to his master. He shall not waste the goods nor hurt his master nor procure it to be done. He shall not, what shall he do? But the funny thing is, he can't go to taverns, alehouses or inns, haunting them, nor play at cards, dice or tables. Matrimony he shall not contract nor absent himself day or night. And that was all on the Mowbray benefit side. And the benefit for my ancestor was he was going to be made into a surgeon, the art of a surgeon, for 30 pounds sterling of lawful money, which is quite a lot in those days, with sufficient rules of instruction. And his dad promised and agrees to provide everything for him. So Mowbray put the thing in his brain, and he turned up wearing decent wearing apparel, had meat, drink, lodging, washing, and other necessities for his rank and degree, which was quite, quite a senior thing to be a surgeon, even as an apprentice. 
In 1799, he went to London for six months at St. Thomas's and Guy's hospitals, learned the practice and operations of surgery, and this is his license to operate from those two, um, those two hospitals. And it's easy to read this. Certified George Bellamy hath attended the practice of operations of surgery as a pupil in this and Guy's hospital for six months last in 1793. And at the bottom, someone's written, and during one course, he diligently dissected and made, an, made anatomical preparations. So he'd actually been inside a body before he got into a battleship, which is pretty good. There's the Bellerophon. He didn't serve on it straight away. He went, first of all, to the West Indies on another battleship entirely. And then he was captured and put into a prison camp in Campagne, in France, where he spent three years. And the bastard French took away all his stuff, including his uh, instruments and his clothing. They put him in peasant outfit, and he was in Campere prison a place where he helped the people who were sick. And as a result of that, one of the people who was also in there was a, what was the name of the fellow who, Bly, Bly's uh, brother or cousin or somebody was also on the, on the list there. And he mentioned back to England what a good bloke this Bellamy was, and he was promoted full surgeon while he was actually in prison in France. And when he came back, he was repatriated. They used to swap prisoners in those days. The French got their quality people back, and we got ours in England. And he went on the Bellerophon. Bellerophon's a Greek god, nicknamed by the sailors the Billy Ruffian. And it was pretty rough. Pretty rough. Naval surgeon number 97, amputations, splinter wounds, and burns. And I'm very much, very much indebted to uh, a very good man over here, Mr. Remember, surgeons are Mr. Dick Bunton, stand please, Dick. Let everyone know that you're a bloody, he's a bloody good chap because he, he rescued me in the, in the hour of need, the same as surgeons rescue people when they got bad hearts. I had to get myself round the stuff for the surgeon did without knowing the language. The surgeon of man of war should have in sufficient quantity always by him in readiness capital instruments, crooked, crooked, crooked needles of all sizes threaded with proper flat ligatures, several tourniquets, a large quantity of scraped short flint, lint, flint, some mixed flour in a bowl, what the hell do we do with the mixed flour? Make some cookies. Double and simple headed rollers for bandage or bandages of all lengths and breadths. For slight wounds, those made of bunting will be sufficient, but for cases of more consequence, such as amputations, <laughs> fractures, dislocations, the linen roller must be used. This is a picture of a surgeon, and I put Bellamy's head on it to show that, you know, this is the body of a man, surgeon with his proper uniform on, and here's, uh, here's uh, Bellamy. Pins in plenty, splints of all sizes, which when used should be armed with towel or old linen cloth. A fellow called William Northcote wrote down what he should have. Amputation, Percival Pot, way back, 1779. It is an operation terrible to bear, horrid to see. Leave the person badly mutilated and imperfect, but necessary. From the beginning of the 18th century to the discovery of general anesthesia, 1846, patients had to undergo it with no pain relief, as you all know. The advances were made in count to counter hemorrhage and improve the quality of amputation stumps, but no measures evolved to reduce the danger of lethal wound sepsis or abolish the pain of surgery. It was absolutely bloody awful. So, uh, has that gone on to the next one? Yes. Cannon or musket wounds, destroyed tissue. And people at the time thought it was from gunpowder or before, Bellamy's time, and they treated it with boiling oil. But Ambrose Paré, who was a surgeon in 1536, Frenchman, had no boiling oil, so he used egg yolk, turpentine, and rose oil, and it helped. He also saw that bleeding after surgery could be stopped by isolating and picking up the bleeding cestals accurately and applying ligatures, and later on, someone perfected these uh, crow's head forceps for grabbing hold of the arteries as they were found. Controlling hemorrhage, tourniquet, 1718. Before that, you tapped a rope round and did the Spanish twist, you know, with a bit of, bit of um, twig, and you twisted it round like this, which was not really so good as this so-called modern, more modern, um, the Spanish windlass was what wound the old way fashion up. But he invented one which you turned this gently round, and it pressured onto the location of the blood vessel if you knew where it was, a wing and screw nut. And another picture of it, 
from earlier on is like that. Here's the screw you see which put it on. When a sailor was injured and had half his leg knocked off, they put a rope round quick and then put sort of a windlass round and make it tight, then take it down to the surgeon where he would use one of these to make it more easy for him in 1798 to do the operation. Amputation maybe, possibly, probably. Look at this, this is Dick Bunton's idea of a joke. He sent me a picture of this to scare the daylights out of me, but by the time that we get to um, to Bellamy, the knives were straight. It wasn't a circular cut they did, but more a straight one. Single circular cut. This is from France, this particular one. It was available on the net for sale. It's an amazing thing, isn't it, really? Then Jean Petit, the same who invented the improved tourniquet, induced, introduced the two-stage circular cut. The skin was cut round below the planned bone cut, and then higher up, muscles and bone were cut, high, cut too higher up. Um, and the skin was then folded across. I imagine that if you've got a leg, you did a flap like this, cut back here, and then cut the bone, and then fold it back and sewed round. A fellow called Blomfield, late 1700s English surgeon, experimented with soft tissue, not just skin going across the, um, of the flap, but uh, skin and some muscle. Three-stage cut became the norm after 1773, and we're talking 1798, so that's what uh, George Bellamy would have, been t uh, would have been taught. Improved way of applying ligatures by threading needles at both ends and tying, folding over, and then tying back into the flesh, which la anchored it and made it a far better means of avoiding bleeding. But ligatures were left long. And when you sewed up the flap, the ligatures were left long outside so that um, pus and butts would, would flow out. But of course, it also allowed stuff to flow in, which was not a good idea. Notes taken by his son, John Creamer Bellamy at Edinburgh in 1825, there. Amputations. Now this is very hard to read, so I've very kindly done a translation of part of it. Watch. Oh. The grand object is, oops, the grand object to go back. A good pad of muscle for the integumen to cover entirely the whole stump, which should be on the plan of a hollow cone. And Terry will now stand up and tell you what an integument is if you don't know. Terry, stand. <laughs> Integuments for covering. Oh, thank you. Well, I didn't know what it was. Though I had Latin behind me, I should have known. I should have known, Elizabeth. I should have consulted you. But I consulted Terry, and he sent back a very helpful thing to telling me. And not just that, but a whole lot more stuff about, uh, about um, words of the time. Forearms may be removed. The lower third always used the circular operation. And he's sitting, listening to the professor yarn on about what to do when you're doing an amputation and making notes. And at the very beginning of his book, he says, the notes were extremely hard to take because the professor talked very quickly. But nonetheless, he took the notes and this is what they look like. T upper arm, the double flap if you approve of it. Always an, no need, of t there is perhaps no need of turning back the flap of skin here, it being so extensible at the, and so on, so on. Shoulder joint, and this was a nasty one. Two operations have been recommended double or triple flap, the latter is best. So these are the notes that he made, and you can see that this is part of a whole text, uh, a whole book of notes that he made preparatory to becoming a surgeon himself. But he was never on a boat, he was not a naval surgeon, whereas George Bellamy was. Alex Hutchinson on splinters, ragged fragments of timber, were violently rent from the planks or side of the ship by round shot. A cannonball would go through three inches of oak, and out the other side. Wounds inflicted by splinters of wood are always more extensive. They simply blow out in a great shower of them and, 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 and go crashing into your leg or your chest or your head maybe with the most frightful contusions and lacerations of soft parts. If not removed, then you'll, you'll get nasty inside. The Battle of the Nile in August 1798. Napoleon abandoned his plan to invade Britain and took off for Egypt, with a whole lot of people who are going to interpret what the pyramids were. Was this a stepping stone to India? The British fleet was ordered to the Med. Nelson in command tried to find the French fleet and took three or four weeks trying to find them, and at last he heard they were anchored at Abukir Bay next to the Nile Delta. Nelson's plan was always find the enemy and attack the bastards, and that's what he did. There he goes. This is the boats coming in. The French fleet all anchored over here, in line. Here comes the Bellerophon among the other boats. 
number seven or eight in the line, leading boats later on. 74 guns, sails in Rabakir Bay, August 1798. And by that time, everyone's ready to fight. And they've got that feeling inside them. Oh my God, what's it going to be like? Very few participants talked about naval battles later. Bellamy never said what it was like, never. And you see people now saying Dad came back from the war and never said what happened. And this was just the same with George Bellamy. So I've had to find eyewitness accounts from other boats in the Bellerophon of battles about that time to show what it would be like. Here's one observer. My sh slumbers were invaded by the sound of the hollow drum, beat to quarters. I heard the hurried cry, turn out, turn out, bear a hand there, move men, move up. Another midshipman nearly nearby roared at me, turn out, don't you know we're alongside the enemy? Don't you know? The bustle between decks, the anxiety as we ascended the ladder, we were confronting Johnny Crapo. Now who's a Frenchman here? Declare yourself as Napoleon fad and tell me what Crapo means. Toad. Uh, that, that's what it means, not you, Toad. Isn't it? Crapo? Toad? What is it? It's a piece of snot. Bit of snot? How dare you? No Englishman would declare a Frenchman to be a piece of snot. Sorry, it's a piece of snot. Now we know. How do you know? Are you French or something? I thought you were South African. Of course, you know because you come from the right place. That's right, Switzerland. The hurry gave me no time for reflection until I got to the main deck, where the hostile preparations gave me some idea that actual fighting is no joke. Another midshipman. Few things compare with chasing the enemy. Now the hubbub was over. We were about to smell powder and feel its effect in real earnest. I began to consider being minus a leg or an arm before nightfall, even if I was so fortunate as to retain my head on my shoulders. No. My God. A strange sensation seized me. The stillness as we approached the muzzles of the enemy guns did nothing to console or reassure me. The interval of suspense, though short, was long enough to bring me face to face with an image of the angel of death holding his grasp, a beloved companion, formidable, awful to a young beginner. This is a young kid maybe 16, 17, going into battle. Marine Lieutenant Sam Ellis on the Ajax. Down below, I watched the preparations by the Blue Jackets, most of them stripped to the waist, handkerchiefs round their heads and over their ears to deaden the noise of the cannon. Many would be nevertheless deaf for days after an action. Some were sharpening their cutlasses, others were polishing the guns as if for inspection. Three or four of them were dancing a hornpipe, but all seemed plainly deeply anxious to come to close quarters with the enemy. Brave men. Here is the battle line of the French. This one here is the flagship, the Orient. I've cut the names out here because we're going to have some action in a minute. It's a tonneau and so forth. There's the, and they were all anchored in a long line. And this is Abukir Bay that goes round there, comes out here. One of the ships coming in from the English side got caught on the sandbank here and got to the battle late, but most of them skirted round and came in to attack one by one by one by one by one. But the French had a real horrible gap in their line, and this was it. They had only bow anchors, bow anchors, their bows. They could swing in the tide. When the tide went out or in, they could swing round, which meant there was room on the far side to, to sail. And that was the undoing of the first four of them, because the English spotted that as they came in, and guess what they did? Watch. Watch. Ah. See what I mean? Coming through. And then the next one took this, next one took this, here's the Bellerophon, and there's the Orient, which is twice its size. And bad luck on the Bellerophon, they clicked. They clicked. For that one. It was a disaster. Twice its fire. 120 guns against 74. Three rows of guns rather than two rows of guns. Not a wise choice. I think if I'd been the captain I'd have sailed on to the next one, but he was a brave man. He came from Ireland. There they are, the battle, drawn at the time. You can see where the Orient is in the battle line here, and there's the, the Bellerophon came in. On board the Bellerophon were 504 officers and men. There should have been 600, but they're always short, and there are only 504. The captain was this guy, 
Destair Derby, and here is my ancestor with his boxer kit. Not all of it, knives, tweezers I suppose, I don't know what that is, looks like a sort of bone arrow, but anyway. But these are the nasty bits and the saw, this is sort of gone here. Drilling a hole in the head is a it's always, it's for drilling a hole in your head? Oh my god. Oh Dick, now you've really disappointed me. <laughs> it's getting really actual. I thought I was going to have an easy time until he turned up, look at it. But that's his kit bag. He's 26 years old. He wouldn't go into battle in his dress uniform, would he? No. Now I've promised Elizabeth I'm not going to dress up, which is why I'm going to dress down. And she's going to be absolutely... Well, this is not easy because I'm all wired up for sound. So I'm taking this off if I can get it off. You may have to help me here, Ross. Can you get this bloody thing off my chest? Get rid of that thing. Get rid of this. That's right. And then pop it down inside so that I can get my jersey off. Yeah, wait a minute. That's right. Pop it down inside. This is me dressing down. I'm preparing for the battle. That's what I'm doing. That's it. Now then. Do you want to back up again? Yeah, back up on here. <coughs> tie, then wear a tie. There's a university tie, rugby club. Look at it. I take it off. We've got Green Island people here. Doesn't matter. Thank you. Now I've lost my bit of... Where have I put that thing? Oh, there it is. Right. He dressed up with a black thing. I was apparently a little bit waxed so that the blood would run off. And this one is just a plain black thing. But he looked like that. He'd roll his sleeves up and get ready for action. Down in the bottom of the boat. Getting all ready. That's what he looked like. But Bellerophon's approach went horribly, terribly wrong. Here it comes. Now the whole plan was to stick an anchor out at the appropriate time of the line. The, the anchors were normally here, of course, so they had to drag an anchor round, drag the line round and attach it here, and then let it loose and drop this at the right moment, so that when it tightened, the boat would swing like that, and its firepower, look at it, would be all onto the opposing boat, in this case the Orion, where the Orion's boats could only concentrate with the bow ones. And that was the plan. And in came the Bellerophon with that plan. The sailors knew what they were doing. The captain knew what he was doing. What the Abu Kia Mud didn't know was that you had to anchor an anchor. Bloody Egyptian mud. Yeah. The last thing they wanted. The last thing they wanted. And because they were taking the sails in and adjusting the bow anchor to put that down so they held themselves steady, and chucking things out into the rigging of the Orient so the whole boat would be steady when it fired, this other one got two salvos away before the Bellerophon managed to fire. So they were already being euchred by three rows of guns when they only had two before they could fire. Down the cockpit of the, or the, on the all-op so-called deck was Bellamy. There he is, except he doesn't look like that, does he? He looks like this. <laughs> and look what he's carrying. A bloody great <coughs> knife. And he was helped by two assistants. The purser was there because he didn't know where else to go, fat man. The, the chaplain was there, so he'd go around and help with the uh, interpretation of the Lord's Prayer. And they had loblolly men. Loblolly men were men too old or too young to man the guns. And that was the team that were on the all-up deck where the surgeon was to help the surgeon. Bellamy's surgery on the all-up deck below the waterline in the cockpit, normally the midshipman's sleeping area. John Atkins, a respected naval surgeon, wrote in 1734, the cockpit should be carefully organized. I should think so. Before the battle with rapid, efficient division of casualties. Three groups based on immediate need. Greatest emphasis on staunching hemorrhage. I may have mentioned somewhere that the tradition was you dealt with the first people first, whatever the rank. But that never happened because some people were so bloody sick they had to be helped first. He was helped by the assistants, these two assistant surgeons who were both in their teens, to put dressings on. William Northcote. 
If more than one wound is brought in at a time, always first take care of him in immediate danger. So there was, there was you know, you, you expected to get treated in line, but in fact the horrible ones, the nasty ones with two legs off, we get dealt with first. There's the boat. There's the boat in cross section. Here we have main deck, deck, main deck, gun deck here. The hole down the bottom where all the gunpowder was and the cannonballs. Oh, the cannonballs were alongside the, the, um, the, the guns. The lower gun deck down here. All up deck was down here and it was just awful. Look at the height of that one, the height of this one. I went on the all up deck on the Victory and I banged my head. Wherever I stood, I banged my head. And he was my size. He was a tall man. He was called the little doctor by the, by the sailors. And down here, bowsprit, foremast, mainmast, cockpit. Cockpit is here. This is where this one whole row here was when the midshipmen had their quarters. And all the quarters were taken down, all the beds were taken out, and it was just a big area, big open area, ready for the people to be brought down the steps and lined up for surgery. Mizzen mast and the captain's cabin up here. That's where he did his um, all upping, mostly lopping. The surgeon at work, one of the first born down was the captain. Knocked unconscious by a flying sprinter, brought down unconscious. They call it concussion nowadays, and we know about that in rugby, don't we? So he was brought down, he was a front row man probably, so he was brought down with concussion. The numbers brought down to the surgeon, we know. 25 men were disabled, just contusions, badly smashed up that is. 25 men badly wounded, contused wounds. 75 men with severe wounds, and 26 of that mixture dying in the cockpit. For instance, when they had both legs shot off. Some died while they were lying there. They were brought down with these tourniquets on, but simply died before the surgeon got to them. How do we know this? We've got Bellamy's casualty list, written up early the next day. And the next day, you go around and find the injured lying in lines on the all-up deck. He put them into less injured, more injured, and dead in piles, in, in groups. And he went around listing the names, injuries, and occasionally the treatments and causes of death. And this has survived in the family, despite some ghastly man trying to sell it off. He tried to flog it off on, the, on eBay. The log starts with 26 men who died in the cockpit during the battle. Another 24 died where they stood, or they were so badly injured they were simply thrown overboard. Still alive, but off you go. See if you can swim. There is his notes. Read them quickly. If you can't read them, this is what they say. Amputate, loss of leg and many shot wounds of body and thighs. Severe splintered wounds of arms suspected by a previous hemorrhage. These are all dead. Both legs broken in pieces by hemorrhage before visited. Bowels exposed, whole of abdomen. Now surgeons here will recognize that these people are not well when they arrive. And they do their, a surgeon does his best with them, but really this was bad news for these guys. Shot through the chest. Both legs off found dead when visited. Ditto, 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 ditto. Both legs and one arm shot off. Fractures various. Both legs off. 13 men, officers listed first. That's a pile of dead bodies. The next page. Oh, bowels exposed, hole of abdomen. I just want to point out that some of them weren't very well. And these guys were dead when he visited them. He went along to try to find someone to treat, and he found them dead, so they had to be left there. Page two, 13 more dead, and a summary of totals at the bottom. There's half his head off, is it? This is what it says. Shot in the abdomen, both arms off, both thighs ditto, half head gone, one thigh, fracture of head and arm, one leg off, both thighs, one thigh, both thighs, one thigh, ditto, ditto. Large lacerated wound of arm great vessels torn. He died of hemorrhage before it could be amputated. 26 of them. There are 26 who were dead. And remember another 24 who are dead up there or over the side. And the rest of them, that 98 of them, were still alive. But they were badly injured, many of them. And he listed them as well. So we'll go on to the list of them. Oh, he signed his name on that. Half his head is gone. Hemorrhage. Hemorrhage was 
How long does it take a man to die when he's got his leg off and his, your friendly heart is pumping the daylights out of him? How long it take him to die, Dick? Blood loss. Oh, if it's under control, then maybe after he's seen it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, gone. And these guys were brought down, and of course, they wanted to deal with them quickly, but there are a lot of them. Page three, list of men wounded. He puts the top, list of men wounded. And here's one that's quite interesting. We'll see what happened there. This fellow Mitchell. DD, discharged dead later. On the, this was the first, the sixth. <coughs> he was, um, got his arm amputated, died of gangrene. What's gangrene? What's gangrene, Dick? Rot. Down below where he's done his work, you rot. He rotted. Severe lacerated wounds, fractured ribs, severe. All these, all these lived, but he died on the 6th. Contusions, wound of hand. 14 men, 11 seriously injured, one died later. DD, discharged dead. He had to put discharged dead because he had to get the official notification to the, to the naval office that he would be discharged from the Navy. He couldn't just put dead. He had to say he's been discharged. That was his job. He could tell he was dead and he was discharged, so he put that too. Page four. There's something interesting down there, we'll see. Page four. Contused noon. Gangrene. Knee joint broken with bones of leg contused. Died on the fourth of gangrene. Thigh, thigh, scapula, arm, thigh, we're at gangrene again. Here we got loss of left thigh deliquium. Great loss of blood. Now this is a Latin word, and again, Elizabeth, I apologize for not consulting with you, but I consulted with Terry and with Dick, and they came to the same conclusion. This deliquium means you lose it. You just lose it. All right? Lose it. Deliquium. There it is. Deliquium, just there, look. Loss of next leg, loss of blood. Leg off. Deliquium is an archaic term for failure of the vital powers, or swoon. Somebody who bought the daylights out of a jewellery and gave them deliquium a loss of wits. He must have been quite a, quite a character, this, um, this uh, advocate in the court, 1881. What a shame some have disappeared. Lethiferous, deadly, torrified, parched, farcimant stuffings, fungitive, prickling, acculeation, made sharp. And I thought that might be made sharp for amputation sores, but I was wrong. It's acculeation made sharp somewhere else. Other words, perhaps better. Forgotten like demersed, depauperated, depuration. All these words in the medical dictionary have gone because now the surgeons are so clever you don't need them. Marvellous. It's a shame they've gone though. Page five, 24 men, seven serious shot through the shoulder. Now these people, look, they're all, they're contused. This is a pile of men who are much more likely to survive. One died, obscure wound of the abdomen, but most of them are okay. Some are a bit serious, but in a, a, a sort of a pile over there, he'd put the people who he thought they're going to live. And only one died. 24 men, 15 serious. But was there a malingerer? Now look at this guy. <laughs> this one. Loss of little toe. <laughs> Here's people who've lost both thighs. And this guy turns up and his toe's missing, for God's sake. And I wondered whether the guy who brought him down didn't think, now if I just lie here and pretend I'm concussed, I'll be okay, see? I don't have to go back up again. I just wonder how many people did that. I would have done, like a rocket, my God. <laughs> Loss of little toe. And that's what happened. <laughs> 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 Might scare you. Being a malimbra isn't fun. No, that's the big toe going there, though. Look at them all, confused wounds. No deaths here, no deaths here. This is the better, the better group. Page seven, 18 blokes, one died later, includes the three officers. Here are the officers down here. Captain Darby, this fellow here, and the, um, I think he's a mason, but I'll have to look. Let's have a look. William Kirby died. Captain Hopkins, severe wound of head. Confused wounds. He got better and came round and went back up. As soon as the boat was safe, he went back up on deck. <laughs> Lockjaw. Died on the, when's that? Died. Two more seriously into the battle, three men sick before or after, signed off four days later. Where have we got it? Severe splint to widow's scapula, former 99 men, former patients who were down sick already, pleurisy and fever, 
and a recent case got jaundice. So altogether, you've got 102 blokes sick of any consequence. August the 5th, George Bellamy Surgeon. And this would have been the basis for a lift going into the Naval Office to show what had happened during the battle and just after. What was it like on the day itself? Very few descriptions or pictures of the cockpit set up during a battle. On the right, waiting for the surgeon and a mock-up on the victory. What happened was that these um, midshipmen's boxes were all put together in a pile and then a sail was put over it and here are the sur surgeon's implements on there and they stretched the bloke out and did what they had to do to, or he did what he had to do to them. Buckets around, some full of lint, other buckets you put dead bits in. There's a bucket waiting for some dead bits. This is a picture from a piratical, a book about pirates where someone has come unstuck and here's a guy who's throwing a leg off. I don't think it's a very good picture. I don't think he'd actually seen it happen, but his imagination's pretty high. This fellow is saying, let me help him. Little doctor, over six foot tall when the average male height was five foot eight. This is me, but Jane's camera was a little bit, it was not easy down on the bottom deck there. And so I've just blanked it in a bit to show. This is a beam, this is the all up deck. This is me and I have to go around like this. And he was the same sort of height. So he had to go around like that as well, the little doctor. I banged my head on the beams and the lady who was standing beside the uh, surgeon's table said, you need a surgeon, <laughs> like I did. Let battle commence. Cannon, shot, not just round balls, but also these things which swung around and killed people badly. Here's a man who's not very well. Here's someone being removed, but it's an awful picture. But this fellow is lying his head here and his body there. And this guy's trying to help him down to the surgeon. And what's happening here? Well, this is a fellow who is down beside his gun and it's a later cartoon and someone's saying, are you frightened of the enemy? No, he said, I'm just praying to get at them. As he lights the fuse and away goes the shot. Here comes the Bellerophon. Note the anchor going down. This is the top line of guns from the Orient firing at deck level. So whoever's on the deck simply got a shower of cannonballs immediately. And who's on the deck? The officers bravely standing there, dressed up with hats and God knows what not, and of course liable to be mown down. More cannons, bigger cannonballs, upper row of cannons swept the deck. 30 minutes, 100 Bellerophon men were injured, with 50 taken below. Some were not very badly injured, so they stayed where they were. The mizzen mast was shot through and collapsed over the side. Men roared to clear it, lest it catch fire. There it is going down into the water. These are the injury stats. These are the people brought down. Those are the people who are waiting to be surgeoned. And this here is the runder that he managed to help. Help, waiting, injured. In the first half hour. Not pleasant. Look at them probing for these splinters. Look at this arm coming off here. Very t apparently a very technically difficult job to do. This poor sod didn't enjoy himself very much either. Pause from an eyewitness, Camperdown, another battle. Powder Monkey, age 14 in 1797. It was all so indescribably confused and horrible. I was supplying my gun with powder when I saw blood fly from the arm of a man stationed at our gun. I saw nothing strike him. It was horrendous. The lieutenant tied a handkerchief round his arm and sent the groaning wretch below to the surgeon. A boy on the quarter deck was killed. A man told me the powder caught fire, burned the flesh off his face. He lifted both hands as if imploring relief when a passing shot cut him in two. A man named Aldrich was one of his hands cut off by a shot and almost at the same time another shot tore open his bowels in a terrible manner. As he fell, two men caught him in their arms and he could not live, threw him overboard. Listen to this, this is, this is a battle. Our men kept cheering with all their might. I cheered with them, I confess. I scarcely knew what for. Certainly, there was nothing inspiring the aspect of things where I was stationed. Not only, not only had we boys, these boys and men killed and wounded, but several of the guns were blown up to pieces. Mine had its muzzle knocked out. The brave boatswain who came from the sick bed of the din of the battle was fastening a stop on a backstay when his head was smashed to pieces by a cannonball. Another man completed the task and he was struck down. A fellow named John who for some petty, they had people on board from the prisons who were sent off because they were naughty. They had men pressed on whose wives didn't know where they were on board, the Bellerophon, at this time. 
John, some petty crime, sent on board as punishment, which carried past me wounded. Listen to this. I distinctly heard the large blood drops fall pat, 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 pat on the deck as they went past. Even the poor goat kept by the officers for milk had its hind legs shot off and poor man was thrown overboard. Do you wish you weren't here? As I was preparing the stuff, I thought to myself, I'm not enjoying this. I'm doing this for the sake of Terry. Oh, sorry, get on. Such was a terrible scene amid which we kept on our shiting and firing. I felt pretty much, I suppose, everyone else does such a time. We all appeared cheerful, but I know that many serious thoughts ran through my mind. I thought a great deal of the other world, but being without any particular knowledge of religious truth, I satisfied myself by repeating again the Lord's Prayer. He was aged 14. Back to the battle. The two ships in chase fire for fire. The elephant's faster rate, three to two, compensated for its lower firepower. Cannonballs smashed through three inches of mature oak, but they charged their guns with lower levels of power as so the cannon would get through the first one and then ricochet about in the enemy boat. The second half hour, 40 more men taken down. A shot took away, first Lieutenant Daniel's left leg. He was carried away, but was killed on deck by grape shot. Fourth Lieutenant John Hadaway was wounded and taken blow to the surgeon. Fifth Lieutenant George Jolliffe died on the deck. These are the officers going down who are standing there bravely. In the cockpit, a demonic scene by candles. Surgeon Bellamy took a little over two minutes for amputations and helped by two assistants extracted deep splinters from contused limbs, taking over a minute of his time. Between operations, Bellamy selected the next men from the line. In the first hour, 32 men dealt with, 58 injured men waiting. Bloody mess. Look at that. <coughs> Bellamy begged Captain Darby, who had now regained consciousness, for help. None can be spared. Maybe you can persuade one of the women to come and help. Women are on board as wives, wives of the petty officers. A lob lolly boy was sent off, and one of the women agreed to give a hand. She can't have known what she was letting herself in for. Launda hit on the quarter deck, musket fire, helped below by a sailor when the mainmast collapsed, killing them both. Things are not going well for the Bellerophon. Cathcart, senior officer still standing on the gun deck. No more volleys, fire when possible. 20% of the cannons now out of action and 25% of the seamen dead or injured. In the first hour, the injury rate had evened off a bit because the, the firing had, had dropped a bit from the, from the Orion. But you can see there are people here who are injured but not reporting sick. And here are people who are dead where they stood. And these are the people who were brought down to the cockpit waiting for surgery, and helped. Paul Nicholas, 17-year-old lieutenant. Our cockpit exhibited a scene of suffering and carnage which rarely occurs. I visited the whole the abode of suffering with a natural impulse to ascertain the fate of a friend. So many bodies in such a confined space under such distressing circumstances would affect the most obdurate heart. My nerves were little accustomed to such trials, but ever the danger of battle did not seem more heroic than the spectacle before me. On a long table lay several anxiously looking for their turn to receive the surgeon's care, yet dreading the fate which he might pronounce. One subject was undergoing amputation. Every part was heaped with sufferers. Their piercing shrieks and expiring groans were echoed through the vault of misery. Even at this distant period, the heart-sickening picture is alive in my memory. What a contrast to the hilarity and enthusiastic mirth which reigned in this spot the previous evening. 34 more injured brought down, 124 needing surgery stretched out along the all-up deck, some quietly damning, some unconscious, some shouting in pain or demanding to be helped. This is what 124 people look like. This is what 124 people look like. That's the entire male rugby population of the University of Otago Rugby Football Club. There are only 123 of them. We need you, Dick, to come back. Make up the 124, but don't get injured. And this is a picture of what they look like, lined up. And that is only 50 of them. Can you imagine walking down that lot and trying to find someone who can help and who do you help first? Look at this poor sod here, look at him. Blood, you mentioned blood, I forgot that. But the actual fact was that there was, this was down the bottom of the boat and it was at night. 
there was no light at all except for this. Whoops, gone. I pressed the wrong button there, sorry about that. Now you've seen again. This is another surgeon. Ninety wounded were brought down. The whole cockpit, deck, cabins, wing berths and cable tier and my platform was covered with them. For a time they lay on each other at the foot of the ladder. Some had wounds painful but slightly with a dreadful condition of others. But more vociferous, I reprimanded them as their voices disturbed the last moments of others. I asked the commanding, he asked the commanding officer for some men. Died after being brought down. Captain Burns's corpse was removed. This is another boat, mind you. Bonner's right thigh was taken off. It was impossible to use a tourniquet. The stump was presented a mass of mangled flesh. His arm was also shattered. He lived in the state near two hours, calling for help. Melancholy cries, piteous moans, bewailing. I was able to direct my attention to those with the greatest and most essential needs. There and there. Lobbed over the side into the water. At 8.10 on the blower from the rigging from the fallen foremast caught fire, had to be cut away. There it goes. It's in the, going in the water. They had to cut it away and there it went into the water and lay there. But a really extraordinary development. At 8.30 p.m., that's an hour and a half after the battle start, Bellerophon's crew saw fire spreading in the middle deck of the battleship Orion. There it is. What could they do? If it blew up, no one would survive nearby. But who could order an escape from danger? All the Bellerophon senior officers were dead or injured. The sailors found a junior officer, a 17-year-old midshipman with a bad injury into one of his eyes. He was one of 50 injured men who had not reported sick. He was the only officer left on deck. Bravely, he was hiding, actually, behind a cannon. Somehow, he gave the order and helped to cut the cables, set a split sail, and get away. And now, there's the, do you see the cables go? There's the split sail. And look at the Bellerophon. Slowly, slowly sails away. It got so far when the whole thing collapsed. Now it's sitting in the middle of nowhere. No, it's not it's sitting near the Orion. And if that blows up, it goes too. But the tide was moving. And the tide carried the uh, Bellerophon away about a quarter of a mile in the end. There it is being carried away. This is the Orion. Orion on fire. And pe after the battle, of course, the, the rumors went back and the Times published an account and everybody who was anybody painted a picture of it. There are hundreds of pictures of the Orion on fire, and the Bellerophon bravely make its way away. <coughs> 9 p.m., the Orion blew itself to pieces. There's the Bellerophon now, a little bit away, and it's not quite right because the sail wouldn't be on it, but there's the Orion still on fire, and here we go, a massive explosion. French divers recently found a four-ton cannon 200 yards away. It blew that 200 yards, a four-ton cannon. The surgeons battled two minutes plus for imputations and one minute plus for splinters and patching up. 124 injured men would take four hours. At the battle was one and a half, It'd take four hours to treat them, and this is what it looked like. Injured and dying brought down, 124 of them. Others who died where they stood or were thrown overboard. Others who were injured but didn't report sick, 50 of them. The surgeon dealing with the, with the injured and the dying it took four hours, not an hour and a half. The waiting time for those who were brought down, the survivors, the subsequently dead over the next eight days, another eight of them, I think. And so the overall stats for him, survived injured in their stations, 50, died instantly or thrown overboard, died at the all up or later, 58, served the, survived the surgeon, not bad, eh? 92 of them. Pretty good. Pretty good. He was quite a surgeon, obviously. The Orion senior officers, Flag Captain Commodore Louis de Casabianca, had Gio Canty, his 12-year-old son, with him on the Orion. He was called below for an emergency, and he told his son to stay there on the deck until he returned. With fire spreading through the ship, the sailors were ordered to sauve keeper and abandon the ship and jumped into the sea. They told the boy to join them and save himself from death, but he refused. The boy stood on the birdie deck. That's where it comes from. That's it. That poem is it. That's where it comes from. 
26 years later. Francoise Paul Brie de Aiguier, Aigues, Captain of the Orient, there he is, became a hero in France. There he is. Hit in the face and hand, yet the wounds bound up and went back on deck. Both his legs were then shot away, but he stayed his post, strapped to a chair with four tourniquets, with tourniquets on his thighs. Finally died, cut in two by a cannonball. And there was another fellow who was going to rise in the French Navy on board, Villeneuve. This French is untranslatable, but I'll see if I can. He took part in an expedition from Egypt under the orders of Bray on board the William Tell. He commanded the back end of the, of the flotilla, French flotilla at Abu Kir, and he took off. He and three boats escaped this whole mess. In 1805, as an admiral, he left Cadiz on the Bucantere, and he hurled himself against the Britons near Cape Trafalgar, north of Gibraltar. He finally there lost the great battle. Good for him. Postscript. Now I should stop now and it should be exactly time. My God, time has flown. No, it hasn't. It's okay. Do you want a postscript? What happened afterwards? Do you want a postscript? Yes. yes. <laughs> postscript. 30 years later, in 1828, Bellamy is now physician to the Duke of Clarence, who will become William IV, the king. And he went living in Plymouth, practicing in Plymouth. They left the Navy. And he went up to London regularly each month to visit the Duke of Clarence and tell him he was OK. And here he was, crossing Westminster Bridge in 1828. And a voice from the crowd shouted out, Hey, little doctor! Hey, little doctor! Don't you remember me? The lady who helped him on the Orion, on the, on the Bellerophon, the lady who helped him, was now selling flowers. She was a widow. Her husband had been killed at sea. And she survived, of course, with three kids. And she had no money. She was selling laces and flowers. And he said, you're a heroine of the Nile, he said. And he went to the Duke and he said she needs a pension. And she was awarded a pension of 17 pounds a year for life, which was at that time quite a lot of money. That was in 1828. 200 years later, in 1998, John Hindmarsh, the midshipman who cut the cables. Now look at this. Are you ready? This will give you a shock. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. I told the saga of the Bellerophon to an MBA class. Three years later, he said, we've got to have lunch. And he produced his daughter's essay from the family papers, and it was about the boy who cut the cables, his ancestor, John Hindmarsh. Look at the two faces. You all know that. That's the Bellerophon on its way to Plymouth with um, Napoleon on board, about to be sent to St. Helena, and his officers looking miserable. When he got to Plymouth, by this time, Bellamy is the mayor, and he was brought on board, 1815 this is, introduced to, to Napoleon, who found out that he was on the Nile, and greeted him as a hero of the Nile. And they all do kneel, he said, and embraced him. I gave a talk on Lady Hamilton. This is a lady expert. Afterwards, a member of the audience told me she was researching her family history and had found an ancestor, Horatio Giles, who was born at the Battle of the Nile. Could it be true? I, I know some clever chaps, she said. One of the very clever chaps found died at Portsea, aged 89, Nellie Giles. She was on board the Bellerophon at the Nile and was a most useful nurse to the sick and wounded. Three days later, she gave birth to a son. Three days later, she gave birth to a son. The government granted her a pension of 17 pounds a year for life. That was my ancestors doing. On the Bellerophon's Nile muster list, 1044 Henry Giles from Carlisle, Coxon, age on entry 24 in 1796. People have doubted the three days. They think it's three weeks or three months, but that's what the, um, that's what the uh, obituary said of her. Dictionary of 1849. I put this on because John Hindmarsh, just about him, he caught fire, he ordered the cable to be cut and the pitcell to be set. For his conduct the glorious day, Mr. Hindmarsh had the honour of enlisting the public thanks of Lord Nelson, to whom he was personally presented by Captain Darby. 
had the Nile received so severe a contusion as ultimately to lose the sight of an eye, a misfortune for which he never obtained a pension, yet to his honour, be it recorded, nothing could induce him to leave his station. That was the John Hindmarsh that we saw just now. That is Burrow Lodge in Plymstock, near Plymouth, and these, these are built out of the, out of the um, timbers from the Bellerophon. When it was broken up, Bellamy built himself a house, went to Portsmouth where it was being broken up, bought the timbers and brought them back and built himself Burrow Lodge. Billy Foles Hall, antique dealer, went round the family, he was married into a Bellamy relation, went round the family saying, I'll take care of all those goodies you've got from the Bellamy family, which he then conned them to giving to him, then he flogged them off on the web. And one of the things he tried to flog off, the list. Oh, this is the, this is the cannonball. This is the list up here. Autograph. List of officers and others who fell, died of their wounds. And one of the family bought this, thank God, so we've still got it in the family. This cannonball disappeared. Um, and the apprenticeship paper was also bought by another member of the family who found out about this. I won't say what I think of Billy Fells Hall, but you can imagine. That is the poet, 1826, which was published on Casabianca's son. This is Dr. George Bellamy's um, uh, obituary, and down the bottom it says, the Royal College of Physicians, Dick, not surgeons. I don't know why that would be, but he became a physician, I think, after being no, surgeon on the left. The same thing? Okay, all right. There he is as an old man. He lived about 90 with his wife and his daughter. This is his uniform. This is his hat here. Uh, a member of the family decided that one of the kids should go to a fancy dress ball party and they cut the trousers <laughs> so they would fit. Very early on. Early on? Yes, yes it was a long time ago. Just grandfather's trousers. You know? Oh, just grandfather's trousers. Yeah. Um, Nelson gave out to the, f to the people who were really hot at the battle silver with a picture of himself in it. In the 1930s, one of the Bellamy relations took the picture of Nelson out and put a picture of a baby in. That's it. Richard, that was wonderful. Now... Who'd like to be the first comment? Mm -hmm. Maybe one of the surgeons? No nasty questions. No, it's not a nasty question. No nasty questions. Another I'm not a surgeon. I'm not a doctor. I know nothing about bodies. I know no, nothing no. about it's, blood. It's another, though, very much more tangential family connection oh, to yes. the Battle of the Nile. On your list of ships yes. was a ship called the Swiftsure. Yes. yes. And the Swiftsure was built at Buckler's Hard, uh, at the edge of the New Forest near Southampton yes. by a master builder called Henry Adams. Oh, yes. And Henry Adams is my great, great, oh. great, great, great grandfather. Oh. So Live the man at there. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's can wonderful. I, can I say something? Yes. Just wait one minute. Oh, yes, yes. No. Another one of our great, great, great grandfathers served on the swift shore at the um, Battle of Trafalgar. And um, there's one more uh, anecdote. There's a sh there is, in fact, a book written about the B Bellerophon, or the Billy Ruffian, which I've read. At the end, it says, nothing survives of the Bellerophon. But in fact, which has already shown uh, our ancestors' home at Plimstock, which is a grade two listed building. And my cousin, our cousin in Cambridge, who's also a doctor, has possession of what we know of as the Bellerophon desk. Um, uh, Bellamy had a desk made from the timbers he bought from the Bellerophon when it was broken up. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank goodness no questions so far. Um, I'm, I'm oh, don't you ask a question, for God's sake. The, I'm fascinated by the blood and the mess and the gore that was all over the place, with around the bodies, in the bodies. That's right. There was so much that uh, needed to be... <laughs> That's right. Broomed off. That's right. Yes. My picture of the blood 
around those 50 and people is, is very, very the, much less, I think, than there was. I mean, all, the whole place, his whole body was covered in blood by the time yeah, he finished yeah. it. Could, could I ask one of your consultants that, that someone that got gangrene or tetanus, would that have happened so quickly? Or would that have been some days later? No, that would have happened quite quickly because these people are getting shot with a cannonball. Right, so, so the there's infection lots of rotten and torn flesh yeah. to start, which is devascularised right. and really dead right from day one. So the answer is probably yes. Right. And that's the reason they amputated, to try yeah. and stop gangrene. Mm -hmm. Because the limbs weren't reconstructed. But you made a very in interesting point when we met about your friend down in Vicargo who was shot with a... Yes. Tell us the story of that, the one who lost his leg. An old school teacher in the South and boys called Norm Jones, who was a bit of a colourful MP. And he, um, in World War II, was standing on a tank and fell over and couldn't understand why he couldn't stand back up again. And he had his leg shot off with a tank round. Didn't feel it, no pain, nothing at all, to start with. Yeah, that's right. So, what about infection, Pompey? Like, what about what? Infection. How did, did more than, was it more than the eight people? Post operate, like no, post operative. Well, he only filled up about, I think it was five days later, but I think the eight that I've interpreted, yeah. the eight I've interpreted as, a, as an eight is in fact a five. I think it was five days later he said how many people had died afterwards, and that was eight. <coughs> there may have been more later, Do you but know we don't know, no, we don't know. No. Oh, infection, gangrene, lockjaw, lockjaw. Gave up hope to live, I think, some of them. Boiling oil on the um, amputated stumps to, to uh, try and prevent the. Well, that was earlier on because he was boiling oil and then they used to cauterise with, with hot irons. Yeah. Mm. And then Richard means a guy called Ambrose Parr, who in the French battlefields changed it to rose water, yeah. turpentine, yes. and something else. Yes, right. In actual fact, it was a turpentine that was actually quite a good disinfectant and that was quite a step forward <laughs> in preventing the infection. So that's what he was using. Yeah. That's right, and rose, rose oil or something like that. Mm. Yes, here's a person with a question. Wait, wait, wait. I don't think that microphone's working. No, I don't. It's it for the recording. Oh, okay. Do you have any uh, idea of the total numbers of casualties on both sides? And, and, and where was Nelson all this time? Nelson was on board one of the boats. Uh, I should know which one, but I don't know. The The... People dead on the Bellerophon and injured was, was, were 200. The total killed and injured on the English side were about 1,500. And the total killed and injured on the French side has been the subject of great dispute because no one knows what happened to the sailors on the, um, on the Orion, whether they all got blown up or whether they in fact survived, were picked up by the English because after people threw themselves off of, of the um, boats, they were picked up by either side and treated as prisoners they were, the, the ethic was they couldn't then attack the people who saved them. And there's a wonderful story at Trafalgar of the Achille, which is a French boat, uh, which had been worsted by one of the English boats. And the French were all jumping off. The English launched little boats to go and pick them up and bring them back. And they saw a cat on a cannon. <laughs> and they went and rescued it. Oh, it had been burnt. It had been burnt. The cat had whiskers burnt, yes. Wow. So about... About 7,000 on the French side is the estimate, yeah. But maybe in more if the Orient crew was added in. Orient had 700 people on board. Also, Castrobianca is supposed to have been down in the bottom of the boat and his son on the deck. Um, others say that they saw the two of them clinging, clinging onto a, onto a, a spar and, and both drowned. So no one really knows. But certainly the man went down under the deck and the boy refused to leave the deck. That's certainly true. Yes. Oh, did they? Yeah. Right. No, I didn't know about that, but yes. Blood would be on, on, the, on the gun decks in plenty, and of course down on the all-up deck. It would be yeah. just awful. Well, they had sand boys. Sand? Well, they had sand for putting out fires as for, and for spreading on the deck, and they put sand on the deck before the battle to, to mop up some of the blood. But when the French were seen through the Orient's portholes trying to put the fire out, they were using water from, the, from outside, but mostly it was sand. And of course, it, it, what happened was they'd been caulking the decks with tar. 
the couple of days before and it was all soft and runny and of course that, that just simply spread the fire right along the deck. They were doomed as soon as the fire started really. Yes. Awful. I heard recently, well read recently, was a ship, the Lorien, was actually carrying powder for the army. Yeah, oh right. Well, oh right. Land. Really, that, that would have made a, well it made a huge, you heard miles away of course. And they say it stopped the battle for about 10 minutes. In fact, I think it would have been a bit longer. Everyone was so shocked. I mean, the noise of these battles was horrific anyway. It was pitch black outside. I don't know if you've been in the Mediterranean. I've been in Tripoli, and when it gets dark, it gets dark. In the desert, it's dead dark. And Abuki would have been black, except for a few lanterns swinging about in the boats. Just unbelievable, the conditions. And Nelson attacked knowing that. He must have had faith in his crews. Gosh, unbelievable. I think you've had enough, don't you? Seen enough Just blood. Real... Has everyone enjoyed it? Look, uh, this is a, it's a family story, and, and um, I've done a bit more research than perhaps some in the family have, and I'm going to so circulate my PowerPoint through other members of the family so they can see what extra things I've found out. Um, it has been a pleasure preparing it, although I must say, on some occasions, I've sat in front of my computer and I've simply wept, because mm. it was so awful. 14-year-old boy seeing a man's head taken off. For God's sake, this is insane. Anyway, Polly, where's Polly? Thanking Richard. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for coming.